usable and 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 having a website serve the goals both of the organization that created the website and of the users. If there's some kind of overlap between the two, then you're, you are likely to have a successful website. If there is not an overlap between the two, then, then you, you might have some issues. You can't begin to talk about addressing a user's goals or an organization's goals until you've actually identified them, though. All right? And you might think that that's obvious. You know, but it isn't necessarily obvious, especially uh, when you talk about users' goals, when you recognize the fact that there could be different kinds of users accessing the site, and therefore not everyone accessing the site is going to have the identical goals. Even with organizational goals, um, there can be variances. Let's say, for instance, we're doing a online website for a jewelry store. What could two different goals be for a jewelry store? Advertiser merchandise. Okay. But what, what's the goal there? Okay, sell their product. That's true. Sell their product how? How could a jewelry store use a website to sell their product? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone care to contribute? What are different ways that a jewelry store could sell more of their product? Sell it online. Yeah. One. Uh, very good. One way is that they could sell it online. In other words, you want to buy such and such watch, you can order it online, right? That should allow them to sell more goods because then you don't have to make it down the store. Yes. Yeah. The other way, in general terms, that you could sell more would be to drive people to their actual stores. All right? So that's two different goals. One goal, if, you, if, if this the hypothetical jewelry uh, organization, jewelry business, was going to try to increase their sales, one goal could be to sell their merchandise online with the thought that that would increase their sales. A different goal could be well, no, we don't want to sell our merchandise online. We want to attract people into the store so that they can buy it. Why might they choose one versus the other? Why might they choose? Why might they choose? Yeah, one versus the other. Depending on the product, uh, if they see it online, but they want to like see it, uh, try it on, they may want to get a visual view of it to see if it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I particularly pick jewelry for this example because, you know, some jewelry items can be kind of expensive and some jewelry items you might not want to rely on just seeing a photograph of it to purchase it. But you might look at that and say, you know, that seems like a good deal. That seems like it's a, a nice piece for what they're charging and that may drive you to go in to see it. I guess the point is, is the starting point for Designing a website is to identify the goals. What we're going to do today is we're going to work through what you're required to do for the design of your project. Um, there's a project overview that we'll spend some time looking at today. Um, I then have uh, an inst uh, instructions and a rubric for the design and the completed project. I have the Dropbox for each of those. And then finally, I have a sample of at least part of the plan. Project overview, we probably won't spend too much time looking at, but just to introduce that to you and to hit some high points. <clears throat> Your job is to create a small website. Six to eight pages would be about right. Um, much less than six pages, you probably don't have enough material and you probably need to, to somehow add some more stuff to your site. More than eight pages, you might be doing more work than you need to. All right? Or maybe you're picking too big of a topic and, and you need to narrow it down a bit. All right? The good news is, it's almost any topic that you pick, we can, if we think about it and we brainstorm together, we can think of ways that you could either narrow it down 
or broaden it. So, you know, if you want to do a website on sports, all right, and, um, you know, you come up with, uh, you know, 53 pages about sports, you know, we could figure out a way to narrow it down. You know, maybe Cleveland sports, for example. If, however, that you, you picked a topic that was too narrow, for example, Cleveland championship sports teams, all right, we could figure out a way to broaden that to say maybe teams that were contenders for championships and, and ultimately disappointed us or something like that. A inspiring name for a website, right? The bottom line is, is we can go in and we can, we can come up with uh, ways to broaden or narrow almost any topic. Um, I don't want you to just sit down and start making pages. I want you to follow through this process. And this process is very closely tied to the thinner of the two textbooks, the book written by Jesse James Garrett, The Elements of User Experience. It takes you through a process, and I think it very effectively looks at all the different levels of web design. It doesn't focus just on the look of the page. It really takes you through from the most abstract level to the most specific level. So I, I like the book for that reason. The goals of the project is to uh, create a website that is technically sound, well designed, and effectively communicates the intended message. The first part of the project is due on November 7th. So you have probably, what, a month and a half, six weeks, give or take, to do that. And you can start on this part of it now. Even if you don't know completely how to get the page to be laid out, laid out a certain way, um, that's a detail that we'll be addressing very soon, so you can, you can start working on this now. The final part of the project is due on 12.5. So uh, again, you have maybe two and a half months for that. At the very bottom of this, I have a rubric, which is kind of the scorecard that I use for grading this. All right. There's five sections to this, and they roughly correspond to, to chapters in the, 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 the book. There's a strategy, scope, structure, wireframe, or skeleton, and prototype, or surface model of it. And again, there's zero through four points in each of those. So five categories at four points, um, it gets your, it gets your 20 points. I have tried to designate like what would give me a zero point answer, what would give me a two point answer, and what would give me a four point answer. Let's look at all these sections in turn. And as we're doing this, we're going to look at my sample uh, document because I prepared, a lot of students had a hard time with this for a while, so I went and I prepared a sample document where I actually created a plan. The good news is that I, I think stu students understand it a lot better uh, than they did prior to me showing a plan. The bad news is, is I get a lot of, I get an awful lot of clones of my plan, all right, which I guess is to be expected. Uh, know that the format, the exact format of mine isn't a requirement, but sort of the content and um, the material that's contained within the plan um, should be uh, taken as a model, but not taken as this is the only, only way that you could possibly do it or word it or whatever. All right. The first section is the strategy section. And the strategy section is where you decide the goals of what you want to do. All right? And as I said before, this may sound dumb. This may sound like obvious, self-evident. Of course, before you develop a website, you want to figure out what you're doing it for. Except for the fact that a lot of things that seem obvious, you know, aren't necessarily really obvious. And, you know, I always ask the question, obvious to who? So really, in the strategy phase, what you do is you define really the purpose of your site. And um, it should discuss, again, a description of what 
the site's purpose is, just a very just general description, a prioritized list of three goals for the organization that's creating the site. So if you're creating this site, you'll have to pretend you're the organization creating it too. You know, if you're going to do one about championship Cleveland sports teams, maybe you're pretending that you are the Cleveland Chamber of Commerce and want to talk about that or whatever. But you need three goals and a prioritize list of three goals for the organization that's creating the site. You also need a prioritized list of three user goals for this project. All right? And I say three goals, but it's really a minimum of three. You could actually have more than three goals, um, and that would be helpful. You then create three user personas. And there's good examples of personas in the textbook. Essentially, a persona is a person, um, a description, a generic description of a person that's going to visit the site. And you want three of them, because as we've identified before, there's not simply one group of people that are going to be visiting your site. All right? There's going to be different groups, and those different groups are apt to have different goals. Therefore, it's beneficial for you if you can see your site and you can try to put yourself in the position of those people to create those personas because that will be helpful in identifying what is best put on the site and how to organize that material. All right, let's look at my sample plan to cover this section. One note, by the way, before we get here. Um, and again, do read through this because I'm not going to read you every line uh, in, in, the, uh, in the document. But the goal should be goals that are specific to your website and not just general design principles. For example, don't tell me that your site is going to be user friendly. I guess I would just assume that. You know, you're trying to make a good site. So why would you even need to say I'm going to make a site that's user friendly? Of course it's supposed to be user friendly. Don't say that my site, your site's going to have clear navigation. Yeah, it should have clear navigation. That's a given. All right. So when you're writing your goals and when you're documenting your goals, don't speak in terms of just things that are just general good web design practices. You know, I will use readable fonts. Well, I hope so, you know. Uh, it sounds funny, but every semester I'll get a list of these things, and, and oftentimes they'll include these as goals. And that really isn't why people are coming to your site. When you think of these goals, think of why someone is coming to your site. Now, depending on the topic of your site, people may be coming on your site to become entertained. People might be coming on your site to get more information about a topic. All right? They're not coming to the site to see what fonts you picked out. All right? To be sure, that's important. You should use a good combination of fonts and colors and all that to emphasize your message and to, to uh, emphasize certain things on your page. That's true, but that's not what brings people to your page. All right? People come to Learning Community site maybe to find out when certain classes are offered. Or maybe to find out how much the tuition costs. Or maybe to find out what degrees that they can get in uh, dealing with business or whatever. Those are goals why people come to the site. All right? Not to see the fonts or the colors or the layout or the navigation. All right? Those things need to be in place, but that's not why people come to the site. And therefore, those aren't goals. Let's look at my sample document. In my sample document, um, I'm saying that I want to do a website about jazz. All right? Jazz is probably my favorite form of music. Many people are unfamiliar with jazz. I want to create a site that people that don't know a lot about jazz can visit and learn more about the great musicians. The site will be geared towards listeners and not musicians and novices as opposed to experts. So when you, when you come up with your idea for your site, you have to start thinking in terms of who the site is meant to appeal to. All right? uh, who is your audience? The, the first rule of any sort of communication is to identify your audience, who you're speaking to. You know? I could do a, a lecture on web design 
um, to high school students or to grade school students or to college students. I may approach that topic differently depending on who I'm speaking to. All right? And therefore, you need to identify that right off the bat. Could you imagine if I was doing a website for musicians as opposed to people that listen to music? The site's going to look a lot different. It's going to have a lot different stuff in it. All right? It's going to talk about, you know, keys and, and melodies and harmonies and, and music theory and that sort of stuff. Whereas most listeners either don't know or don't care or they're not thinking in those terms when they're, when they're thinking from the listener's perspective. Most listeners, anyhow. So therefore, it's important to start out and to sort of give your uh, project um, limits. Obviously, almost any topic, you could go on forever. You know, go to a bookstore or the library and look up books about jazz. You'll find dozens of books with hundreds of pages each. So you could write a lot about this. You have to take the approach of, well, what specifically do I want to express about it? And who's my target audience? And on what level am I going to try to reach them? So the first part of your strategy section will be an overview. All right? The next part are a set of three goals each for organizations, for the organization, and users. <coughs> My organization goal is to broaden the popularity of jazz by educating people, to expand listeners' horizons by introducing them to musicians, and to give an overview of the complete history of jazz. Those are my three goals. All right? The three goals of the listener, first of all, to find other musicians similar to musicians they already like. All right? You know you like Dizzy Gillespie. Who sounds like Dizzy Gillespie that you might also like? All right? To find biographical background information about jazz musicians. Gee, who did, what bands did this guy play in before he had his own band? That might be information that a listener would want to know so they could go and check out those earlier bands. And to get information that will assess them, assist them in building a jazz record library. Those are what I anticipated my three user goals are. All right? Notice none of those goals relate to specifically how the site's going to look. I don't say, you know, they'll be able to, um, you know, click on a page and see a list of musicians. No, that, that's, we're not talking about, like, the site design and how it's going to be laid out. We're talking about the goals. Why is someone coming to this site? You know, not how the site's going to look or how the navigation's going to be or anything like that. What does someone expect to get out of visiting this site? Now, how do you come up with those things? In a way, we could probably reverse the order of the goals and the personas. But the personas are how you develop the goals. You could actually develop several goals for each persona, right? Because every type of person um, that's visiting your site might have different some goals in common and might have some goals distinct to them. For example, um, current students and potential students and parents of students may all want to know what the tuition is at Learning Community. How much would it cost to go, for me to go here for a semester? All right, so that's an example of a goal that would cross over. But there might be some goals that are very distinct to a particular group, like how can I rent out the Spitzer Conference Center? Yeah, you know, most students really aren't interested in that. But if you're a business and you want to have a meeting here on campus, yeah, that's something that's, that would be important to you. You actually, and, and this kind of sounds corny at first, kind of sounds dumb and, and contrived, but it's really beneficial. And I'll, I'll try to explain to you why it's important to do this. But when you create your personas, you actually make up little fictional people. All right? You name them. All right? This guy's Brad Parker. And you make a little story up about him. All right? Brad Parker listened to jazz music growing up. As his father was an avid fan, he 
as he grew up, he stopped listening to jazz. Now he's getting older. He's interested in rediscovering the music and learning about contemporary jazz musicians. That tells you a little bit about the person's background. That tells you about a little bit about what they know and what they don't know. All right. They may be general, generally familiar with some aspects of it, but maybe aren't very up to date. Is probably a good way to summarize this person. Now, why do you suppose I go all the trouble of giving this person a name and making up a little background story? Why bother with this? Why do I go to this trouble? To make more work for you, obviously. All right. No, that's not why I why we do this. Any thoughts? The more you know about your users and the more that you can put yourself in the user's shoes, the better you're going to be identifying their goals and the better you are going to be about making choices about how you can structure your pages and what specific items that you're going to need on your site to achieve those goals. Um, software developers all the time talk about the user. Well, the user will do this and the user will do that. And in a way, that's sort of a mistake because, it, again, it assumes that everyone using a piece of software is identical. <laughs> All right. Um, you might say when, when, when the user opens up Word, they're going to do this, that, and the other. Well, there's a lot of different kinds of people that, are, that open up Word, right, and use Word. Word's used to create very professional looking newsletters. Word's used to, um, for me to type my lecture notes. Those are very different things, and I have very different goals when I go in the Word that someone that may be publishing a corporate newsletter has. All right? Therefore, the finer degree that you can identify the user, and instead of talking about the user in very abstract terms, to talk about specific sorts of people, all right, the better off you can be. Obviously, everyone visiting your website is an individual. Everyone's going to have a mix of needs. And there may be no one that perfectly fits in any of the categories of the personas that you've defined. But you know what? It's better than lumping everyone into one category and calling them the user. All right? At least by creating these personas and differentiating between different kinds of people, you're doing a better job putting yourself in the user's shoes and determining what it is that the users want. So here's one persona. Here's a second persona, Mary Nelson, has listened to jazz in a class, but doesn't really know anything out of it, but kind of likes it and wants to find out more. And here's a person whose friends uh, are listening to jazz, um, and he wants to go back a little bit and um, study a little bit about the history of the music. Three isn't necessarily a magic number. Uh, I picked three because that seemed right for a project about this size. In a, uh, you know, in a larger project, you, you'd have as many as you had, right? In other words, there's no, nothing magic about three. Um, if you were doing one for a college website, you might include a persona for a current student, a persona for a high school prospective student, a persona for a faculty or staff member, a persona from a member of the community, and so on. So, you know, three was just, seems like a good number, all right? Um, ten for a project this size would probably be overkill. One is probably not enough. You're not doing uh, a good job really trying to put yourself in the user's shoes. Are we going in the wrong direction if we use real people? No, I, mean, I suppose not. Okay. Could you use real people? Yeah, I don't care. Right. Yeah. As long as you consider those people to be representative yeah, of, of yeah. who is actually going to be visiting the site, sure. Um, you know, um, this could be like a cop show and you could change the names to protect the, the innocent or whatever. All right. Okay. So the strategy phase is all about deciding your goals. Know what you want to do before you start doing it. And that sounds basic and fundamental, but you'd be amazed how many sites, at least by looking at the results, seem to have skipped this part. 
all right? Because there's a lot of stuff on the site, but there doesn't seem to be any set of dire sense of direction, and it's very difficult to get the answers that, uh, that, that you want out of the site. So after the strategy section, and after we've defined our goals, the next step is the requirements phase. And here's a few words about the requirements phase. The requirements should be the specific content that you're going to put on your site that's going to help satisfy those goals. So, if I've said that one of the goals of um, a person is to know how much it's going to cost here at Loring Community, you should somewhere on your site say, well, gee, I'm going to have a tuition chart that describes for, you know, in county, out of county, out of state, how much it costs to go here for a certain number of credit hours. If I've said I want to know what degree programs are available, gee, there better be content to have that on there. So in the requirements, you take a look at all the things that you think would help your users satisfy their goals and what more help your organization to achieve those goals. Maybe one of the things that you want to do on your site is provide frequently answered questions so that people aren't constantly calling and asking the same questions over and over again. All right, that will free up people answering the phone maybe to work on something else and provide better customer service. You know, so maybe one of the goals of the organization is to answer, uh, you know, the organization if for a college website might be to answer frequently asked questions concerning financial aid. The thought being that if you can answer the questions on the website, then people don't have to call in and people here at LC don't have to take those questions, which means that they can be busy helping out other students with bigger problems uh, other than ones that have a, a quick, short, easy answer. Now, the goals and the requirements tie closely together. Every goal should be addressed by at least one requirement. And if you think about it, that makes sense. If I've identified this is one of my three most important goals, and yet I have nothing on the site, that contributes to satisfying that goal, sounds like I missed the boat, right? Most important thing on this site is to let people know how much it's going to cost to come to LC. Yet there's no content that I plan on having on the site that addresses how much it's going to cost. Gee, something's wrong with that. Now the reverse is true as well. Everything that you say you're going to put on, the, uh, uh, on, on your site, all the requirements that you say that you're going to put on your site, should correspond to a goal. All right? If it doesn't correspond to a goal, then maybe you don't need it, and you can get rid of it. Um, maybe I have the, the bright idea of including pages about the different professors' hobbies. All right? What do professors do in their spare time? Now, if that doesn't somehow map to a goal, either of the organization or of the different users of the site, then maybe you don't need that on the site. All right? And consider getting rid of it. Now, maybe it does map to a goal. Maybe one of the things, uh, one of the goals um, that you would have is to um, show the broad level of experience that the professors have here at LC. In which case, maybe talking about their hobbies is relevant. But if it really doesn't map to any of the goals, then get rid of it. All right? Why? Again, to eliminate clutter. Don't have the idea that, gee, the more I put into the site, the better it's going to be. That's not necessarily true, because the more that you put into the site, the harder it's going to be to find everything. All right. The more that you add to the site, the more likely you are to distract people from the stuff that they're really looking for. So you do want to be careful, and you don't want to include stuff that isn't needed. All right. 
I would guess so you'd have 15 to 20 fairly well worded requirements. When you define your requirements, again, don't speak in general web design principle terms. Don't say that a requirement is that it has a good navigation. Of course it's going to have a good navigation. All right. Why would you bother designing a site that has a bad navigation to it? All right. So you don't even really need to say that. You, what you need to talk about is what's distinct to your website, that is the content. What content are you going to put on the page that's going to help users um, achieve their goals and to help your organization achieve those goals? Here's my list of requirements for my site and you can scan through them. You should be able to, and I didn't do this, but you should be able to, for every goal up here, notice I have 01, 02, 03, you should be able to write down the goals that this requirement addresses. So I've numbered the goals 01, 02, and 03, U1, U2, and U3. I should be able to write down next to this to say, yeah, that addresses goal U2 and O2, for example. When I'm done, if there's some goal that I haven't addressed, I know I missed something. There's more stuff I need to put on my site because one of the goals that I've identified doesn't get addressed. By the same token, if I have something in the requirements that doesn't address the goal, you might ask yourself, do you really need it? Get rid of it. Okay, the next portion is the structure portion. And the structure is where you decide how you're going to organize your content into different pages. Let's think of an online sporting goods store. Let's say we're making an online sporting goods store. And we have a bunch of merchandise. We have sporting, sporting goods that we need to sell. What are some different ways we could organize those sporting goods? Let's shout out some ideas. What's one way that we could organize goods in a sporting goods store? By the sport itself. By the sport itself. All right. So one way I could organize it is by the sport. So I could have a home page. And I could have tennis basketball, softball, and so on down the line for each sport. That's a reasonable way to organize the stuff, right? I'm not saying it's the correct way, but it's a reasonable way. What's another reasonable way we could organize the stuff? Yeah, by gender. Maybe you have Men's sporting goods, women's, maybe even, you know, children's, boy and girl. All right? Reasonable, right? Not saying it's correct, but it's reasonable. What's another way that we could do it? Possibly by price. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily be the main way I would organize it, but you could do something within these, certainly by price. But, yeah. Maybe I could organize it by product and have the shoes, equipment, clothing, and so on the line. The point is, is with Two minutes of brainstorming here, we came up with three very reasonable ways to organize the material. All right? And certainly, when you start adding in uh, more levels of detail, for example, 
it was mentioned price. And I don't think price would necessarily be the top level of organizing, but price very well might fit in over here. Maybe on the second level down. So for each shoes, you'd have the cheaper shoes and the more expensive shoes, and you'd have them separated that way. So just thinking about this for a few minutes, we came up with several different reasonable ways to organize it. Now, what's the right way to organize it? I, I don't mean which one of these would you choose. I mean, how would you figure out what the right way to organize this is? By looking at the goals, by looking at, pardon me, other possibly other websites to get ideas, and by looking at the personas, all right, by looking at the people and their goals and try to figure out which one is most conducive to that. Now, large organizations sometimes do uh, substantial testing in this regard. Uh, this is a whole big thing. Uh, as you can imagine, for smaller websites, it's not that huge of a deal. But for large websites, this could be a mammoth undertaking. Um, one summer I was at the, the NASA Glenn Research Center uh, as part of a fellowship, and I heard a lecture by their internal web people that talked about how they organized the forms on their website. Their internal website, you know, not their public website. Well, you can imagine, you know, what do people always joke about the government with is paperwork and red tape and all that. A government organization has a bunch of forms, right? They have forms to order new forms, you know, they have forms for everything. You know, you get a cup of coffee, you fill out a form, it seems sometimes. So they have all these different forms, and people naturally have a hard time finding them, because there's so many of them. What they actually did is they built prototypes, and then they observed people in navigating through and saying, for example, you know, that they sat someone in front of each of the prototypes and would say, um, imagine you had to take vacation and you're looking for a vacation form. And they'd see how easy it was for them to find it. Did they click and then go, oh no, that's the wrong place and have to click back? And, or did they like make it the first time through? And they did that and they made observations and from that they came to the conclusion. That's a great way to do it if you can. If you're a large organization for, with a large website, that's a great way to do it. Unfortunately, many small organizations um, don't have the resources to do that. So what they'll do, again, is you take your best guess at it. Um, yes, it is possible to organize your material a couple different ways on your site. However, know that anything that you do with that, any options that you give or flexibility that you build in, just makes your site more complex and, and again, gives a potential for people to get lost in it. All right? So, one thing I will say to keep in mind, this needs to be done from a user perspective, not from an organization perspective. All right? The NASA forms, for example, um, it may be obvious to the person making the site that this department handles this form, this department handles that form, this department handles that form. Well, other people in the organization may not know that. They'll look at it from their ways, you know. How do I get reimbursed for this? How do I request vacation? I'll give you another example. Here at LC, we know, for example, that the software development program is in the business division, as is the web development uh, associate's degree. But it wouldn't have to be that way, right? In another organization, it could be set up, another college, it could be set up differently. Well, if the only way you could get to the web development program was going through the business division, that means that you assume that the outside world knows how your departments are set up, which may not be the case at all. So you do need to, to take and apply from the user's perspective um, how to organize this. Now, in the, case of, in the case of my sample project, I went through and I considered a couple other possibilities. I decided to organize my pages by instrument. So I have all the trumpet players on a page, have all the saxophone players, piano players, and so on down the line. And I give sort of a rationale of why I do that. It's important to consider at least a few options. Don't say that it's the obvious way to do it is this way. Well, 
take some time to think through what the other options are and decide um, if indeed that's the best option or not. All right. And again, you can read through my rationale of why I chose to do that. And in my rationale, I'm looking back at my users and their goals and seeing what makes most sense for them. For example, one of the things I considered instead of by instrument was chronologically. You know? Well, the problem with that is someone that's a novice about jazz music may not know really like what era a particular musician was in. Maybe they're looking for more information about a particular musician. Or what about musicians that started playing in the 40s and are still playing now? You know, where do they belong? Do they belong with contemporary musicians or do they belong with the musicians of the 40s? There's a lot of complications there that I thought, hmm, you know, it's going to be tough to figure out. I figured most novices, though, would know, you know, a little bit about musical instruments and would know, gee, I like the way a piano sounds, so let's find some more piano music. And therefore, they'd be able to find it that way. The next section is the, oh, one last word about the structure section. Um, there'll be a couple of different architectural approaches that you read uh, in the book. Let me make this one easy for you. Your site will probably be a hierarchy where you have a home page and you have stuff underneath that and then maybe you'll have stuff underneath those pages. They talk about some other sorts of organization, but for the most part, for small websites like this, a hierarchy makes perfect sense. In fact, if you read through the book and decide that you want to do something other than a hierarchy, you probably should talk to me about it to make sure that you're, you're going in the right track. All right. The next phase is what's called a wireframe. What's a wireframe? A wireframe is just a quick sketch that talks about the main sections of the page. And it might look exactly like that. All right. Now you won't necessarily have one wireframe per page. Right? If you go to websites, you'll notice that a lot of websites carry the same structure throughout them. But, you know, let's look at LC's website as a for instance. Or let's look at Angel even. There's a navigation on the top, there's a task list on the side, and then there's a content area. As I go in, I can see. The wireframe like this would look something like this. course title, main links, tasks, and content. All right. That's what the wireframe that corresponded to this page might look like. It's really just a way of getting organized uh, and thinking about where you're going to put your main sections of code. Um, one of the next topics that we discuss, either Wednesday or next Monday, we'll be talking about how to take a wireframe and turn it into a web page. All right? But it's just a general layout of the way a page is going to look. You might have only one wireframe for your entire site. Maybe all your pages will have the same basic layout. Or maybe you'll have one layout for your home page and then a different layout for all the other pages. That's also a very common approach. Or you might have a basic layout and a couple of oddball pages that are different for whatever reason. They just sort of stick out. There are different sorts of pages so that they stick out and have a different wireframe. The point is, is 
you are likely not going to have a wireframe for every single page. If you do, you're probably doing something wrong. You're probably misunderstanding the purpose of a wireframe. Because the purpose of a wireframe is just to, to take the 30,000 foot view down and seeing how you want to organize the material on the site into like basic blocks or basic areas. The last step in this process is to create a prototype. And I don't do that in my example. That does not mean you don't do that for yours. In other words, if I see this paragraph <laughs> on yours, you know, there's a deduction, right? A prototype is essentially a rough draft of your pages done in HTML and CSS. Are they 100% complete? No. Do you have all the images that you will ultimately put on your site? Not necessarily. Maybe you have some of the images. Do you have all the text written perfectly? No. Maybe in a few spots you use Greek text. All right. The idea of the prototype, though, is to sort of bring your design at least part way to life. All right. It's difficult sometimes for people to visualize or to imagine a website just from a description. All those descriptive things are important, but when the person actually sees it and plays with it, even if it's not a completed design, then they'll get a lot of insight on, on how it should look. Keep in mind this design document, you're turning in one that has all five of these phases. In a more realistic scenario, you may be giving out pieces of this design document as you develop them to everyone on the team to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So you won't necessarily you know, do all five of these steps and then go and build it. You might do a step, send it out, discuss it, and so on. Again, that depends a little bit on, on how the organization works. This design document is meant to communicate between different people that are working on the project, between the people that are working to develop the website, and the people on whose behalf the website is being developed to make sure that you're capturing the right stuff on the web page. All right. A prototype doesn't have to be perfect, but it should give the user a pretty good idea and should allow the user to give feedback then and say, no, I want this to be bigger, I want this to be smaller, I don't want the color to be that bright, and so on and so forth. All right. So it needs to be a model, sort of a working model. And like any model, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it does need to sort of give people an idea of how the actual site will look. Any questions at this point? That's what you deliver in the first phase, those five different sections. Next time we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the last one, that is the prototype, and what makes for a well-designed page. All right. And then we'll talk about standards and XHTML. And then we'll start getting on exerting more control over the layout of your pages so that we can get a page that looks like the wireframes that we sketch out. Are there any questions? All right, see you up in lab.